and our subject is correcting spiritual coldness. Now, <clears throat> we have completed our series of studies in one epistle of Paul, and we come to just an individual study today. It's an opportunity for us to consider this topic of the spiritual warfare and Christian coldness, its spiritual coldness in particular. So it's the 10th verse of chapter 6 of Ephesians, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I'll just make some comments, first of all, on spiritual coldness. When the soul of the believer is languid and, uh, well, we're alive, we are converted people, we know the Lord, we have proved him, but there is a phase going on in life, maybe for days or weeks or sadly much longer. Some sentiments register with us, some things move us and affect us, but there's no great spiritual energy or assurance or joy or love for God. No great desire for the word of God. That taste for worship and adoration is diminished and jaded. Fervor certainly has run down to some degree or other. It may be serious, it may be slight, and we're coasting, as it were, on the things that we know. But there's definitely something wrong. There's a weak hold on the things of God. Now, perhaps uh, intellectual interests are still strong, and that masks the fact that can happen. A person can be passionately interested in the doctrines, and obviously that's good. A person can be actively reading independently and individually, apart from the scripture, the great doctrines of the faith, appreciating them deeply, even reveling in them. And yet the heart may not follow suit. The heart may be cold. Worship may be lacking. Feelings may be low. Assurance may be in a poor state. And it's all masked because we can enjoy and we can... Uh, discuss even, reading perhaps church history, doctrine, all kinds of things. And then sometimes, well naturally, Christian fellowship and friendship masks a reality. Among the people of God, there are your best friends. There are people who you know well and understand you, and you understand them, and you have a great deal in common. And uh, so the house of God is still attractive, and you engage with people. And it can mask the fact that your own relationship with God is not in a good shape at all and love has grown cold. Or you, it may be that your current program is very intensive. All kinds of things going on in life, in your professional life or business life or family life that deeply interest you. And so it's all, well, that's, that's good, that's fine. But it's masking the fact that all is not well on the spiritual front. And it may be getting worse. Your prayers becoming more mechanical and unfeeling. Attendance may be suffering considerably. Attendance at the means of grace and so on. Distractions that you once rejected and had a lot of discipline over might have been permitted by you to come in so you're being distracted by foolish things, entertainments and so on that are uh, not useful or edifying to you, occupied by them, and things that you would have dismissed easily a while ago now take up much too much time. So it all happens with spiritual coldness and it can be much more dangerous than we think. So that's just to introduce the subject. Firstly, a second heading which I'd give is that we have lost sight of the spiritual warfare. And that brings us to our passage. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The need 
for divine intervention and help and strengthening constantly, which uh, <clears throat> is broken down into details in the following verses. But look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. We've lost sight of the enemy of souls and the ferocity of his opposition to us. Wiles of the devil. It's a marvelous translation. It translates the Greek word which we have in the English language in only a slightly shorter form, methods of the devil. Literally, it's methods in the Greek. It's a Greek word. For we wrestle not against, sorry, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the methods, except that in the Greek, the word means more than it does in the English. It particularly refers in the New Testament Greek to uh, methods that carry you away by trickery. Trickery is in the words. So our King James translators rightly translate it wiles. The tricks, the strategies of trickery and craft of the devil that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We've forgotten it. We've forgotten that all kinds of strategies, methods, devices, Paul calls them elsewhere, are going to be employed against us. He speaks to the Corinthians in chapter 2, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. A parallel thought. So the devil has a great arsenal of techniques for bringing us down and pulling us away. And look at verse 12. We've forgotten the ferocity of the devil's opposition to us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, human opposition, but against, and all these uh, titles for the devil and his lieutenants and his hosts, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, this introduces us to a slightly different thought. This battle is a continuous battle. I'll come back to its ferocity in a moment. That's the picture there in verse 13. Take unto you the whole armour of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. You never know when the worst time, the worst attack is coming. It's a military picture there in the background in verse 13. You're defending a fortress or a section of frontier and all is quiet today but the enemy is there and you don't know when the thrust is going to come. You don't know when the attack is going to be launched. The fact that it didn't come yesterday or the day before or today doesn't mean you can all relax because this battle is continuous in the sense that the ferocious attack may come at any time. The enemy is almost waiting for you to think that all is well and then he'll strike. And that's there in, really enshrined in that 13th verse. Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, be ready that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. You saw it coming in the verse. It's building up. Suddenly the assault comes. So you have to regard it as a continuous battle, as a constant undercurrent of temptation and then the great assaults. And you're ready. And having done all, you can stand. This is reflected in the Lord's Prayer, the pattern prayer for daily prayer. Every day, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's there. It's a battle for all parts of the Christian life. All the accoutrements and utensils of warfare, defensive armor, offensive weapons, are here in this passage 
under the illustration of the Roman soldier. And uh, if I go back to verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand. It's every part of you is going to be under attack. The heart, the mind, the will, the conscience. Every part of your personality. The devil will try to invade your heart, your tastes, your affections, your delights, and draw you aside and make you cold to spiritual things. Your mind, your plans, your thinking, your daydreams, what occupies your your rational mind, your will, your determining faculty, your conscience, so that it doesn't operate and you ignore it and it becomes disabled. He's going to try to attack every single part. Your stand crops up repeatedly. It's in verse 11, that you may be able to stand. And then in verse 13, you may be able to withstand and having done all to stand. It's a great word. As a Christian man or woman, you have a stand. You've taken a position. You've been given a new life. It's lived for Christ. You have a worldview. You have a moral view. You have a stand. Now that stand, Satan wants to undermine so that you don't stand. You collapse. You don't take a stand in front of temptation, in front of anything. You don't take a stand for him. You're no longer firm, but you can be swayed to and fro. And it's your stand. You're holding your position in the military analogy, which is more all-important here. Your stand. And then your sincerity. Look at verse 14. It's just a, a glance of the wiles of the devil. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. I haven't time for detail, but in this context, the term truth there will apply to sincerity, truthfulness and sincerity. Your whole midriff is defended by the Roman armor. I'm not going into the different parts this morning, but your central core is your sincerity. You need God's sincerity. You need help and you need it to be augmented and strengthened because your own is under fire and it's weakened. It's what happens when we grow cold, spiritually cold, when we're sliding. Sincerity goes. We're putting on a show. We're not telling people we're in trouble. We're making excuses for non-attendance, perhaps. Sincerity is slipping. Apart from righteousness and having on the breastplate of righteousness, God will provide strength and righteousness. But our own is being undermined. It's under attack. I'll explain that in a moment. Various sins are coming in. Verse 15, this is not only the armor, but the need. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're no longer a witness to Christ. We no longer feel sympathy for lost souls within the family or outside. And help them and speak to them and challenge. We're no longer a testimony. No longer participating in the making known of Christ. And that's got to be put right. And the putting right, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, is all part of the Christian armour. But we're looking at the defects. Verse 16, faith is failing, so you need the shield of faith. And you're subject to doubts and temptations. And verse 17, your great aim in life has slipped. So you need the helmet of salvation. You need to reflect much more on the things of God and of salvation because your, your mind has been taken over by worldly considerations. Maybe business. Maybe things that used to interest you before you were converted. 
all kinds of things you're giving time to. And uh, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God in verse 17. You're not really taking in the scripture as you did. Perhaps you're missing out the, the, the Bible study meetings and such things. We'll come to that. And verse 18, prayer has certainly slipped and you need God's help and strength. Praying always with all prayer, all branches, all kinds of prayer. Even intercession has slipped, the great privilege of intercession for others. And as for watching thereunto, because prayers have become feeble, you're not expecting to note great responses and replies. And you've certainly lost the art of unselfish prayer, supplication for all saints and the need for others. And for the Apostle Paul in his day, he calls, verse 19, for prayers for himself, the prayers of all the workers for the kingdom. So the, all these departments, we're used to reading the uh, Christian armour in terms of God's provisions but each piece also points to some part of us which is out of order because of demonic attack. This is a cunning and ferocious battle. I call you back to verse 12. We wrestle, we fight, not against flesh and blood. That would be easy by comparison. But against these uh, demonic powers and forces, the word in the Greek, to wrestle there is a very interesting word. It really refers to a violent shaking. The form or the manner of wrestling in the great arenas in those days. We know a little bit about it from history, but the word that is used to describe it is a word that needs violent shaking, referring either to part of the wrestling itself or the intensity with which strength was exerted so that bodies trembled and shook in their great effort. It's, uh, what we're seeing here is a vicious and extreme form of battle. So don't underestimate the wiles of the devil and the determination of Satan to bring you down. Nothing is more foolish than a casual Christian. If that's our personality, there are strengths to having a personality which is unflappable, cool, calm, collected, even keeled. But there are weaknesses too because we can underestimate dangers. The casual Christian is in particular danger against the wiles of the devil. He's not fearful enough, anxious enough, guarded enough. The unwary Christian. I heard a preacher once referring to somebody as a cliff edge Christian. Someone who takes great risks in cutting down prayer, in leaving it out, in thinking that the day can close without proper devotions. Walking on a cliff edge when you've got a ferocious enemy ready to take advantage of your every foolish move. Self-confident Christian, even worse, I can cope with whatever, whatever comes at me. We will look at Satan's methods a little more closely and his strategies. What's he doing? Well, clearly, I'll deal with the sin aspect first. He's trying to bring us into sin. Sins of the thought life. Somebody has done something offensive. Let it rankle. Think hostile thoughts. Think critical thoughts. That's just what the devil wants. You'll get every encouragement to that. Let them go round in your head constantly. Think of them morning, noon and night. Antagonistic thoughts. Proud thoughts, where you think perhaps you've accomplished something 
good. Glow with the thoughts, covetous thoughts. He wants you thinking covetous thoughts, desiring more than you need, spending much, 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 too much time on planning the things you need. Covetous thoughts. Well, he wants forms of self-gratification to come back. He knows, he remembers what you used to indulge in before conversion, what your vulnerabilities are. He'll try to bring these back if he can. Unkind thoughts, of course, unclean thoughts, images and so on, if he can corrupt you and bring you in. All these things he will assail you with. Sometimes at a small level, constantly, sometimes leaving you alone and using the evil day policy, suddenly bringing in an assault. Or he may just lure your mind into the world more and more, back into worldliness, into the world's mood music and so on. Then there may be a failure of reflection on the things of God. So how can you praise and love and appreciate? Because you've stopped reflecting. Then he'll try and take from you your strong sense of obligation to strive in holiness, to listen to your conscience, to respond to it, to examine yourself and to seek his help. In holiness, the constant obligation to advance, you tear it away if you can, so that if you can, so that it runs down. And as I mentioned before, haphazard attendance at services, studies, and things that we need. Now, if we can't attend services, if there are complications in life, Things come up that really demand attention. Life is turbulent, great pressures. We're having to work all hours, go through a particularly difficult patch. Well, we'll have grace from God and help. But a lot of the time, the devil will try to disrupt attendance when there is no need. And down we go. There isn't special grace there, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the great rule of the Lord for his people. What is ministry? We can read the Bible for ourselves every day. Yes, but the great thing about the public ministry that God has appointed for us to come together and to listen is always deals with things many things which we won't deal with ourselves. That's the point, or which we need to know. A, a preacher or a teacher of God's word, he's not the elevated person sometimes, some people think. He's rather like a cook. And I'm sure you've heard this analogy before. But if someone's cooking for a family, well, you, it's a considered task. You've got to produce balanced meals. They've got to be nutritious, particularly for a growing family, for adults too. And they've got to have the right and conventional proportions of energy food, building food, and so on, as you know. And you've got to make them as attractive as possible so that people will eat them. And if uh, whoever is doing the cooking in the home Men or women, usually the women, but I don't want to, uh, well, anyway, whoever is doing the cooking uh, fails seriously if there isn't con attention to nutrition and so on. That's sad, that's awful, and it's rather like that with the preacher. You know, I often say we've got evangelism to consider, We've got doctrinal teaching to consider. 
We've got exhortation to consider and we've got the glory of God to consider. There are four departments in preaching, but there are more. Those four basic departments, you have to win souls, you have to teach the doctrines of the faith, all of them. You have to exhort, and exhortation runs from challenge and reproof all the way through to comfort and consolation and the promises of God. But you've got to exhort, apply the word, and then you've got to do your utmost by the help of God to reproduce something of the grace and glory of the faith. People have to feel the greatness and the wonder of Christ and his work and to be lifted up and to encourage. So you've got those four departments. But within those departments, there's a great deal of matter. Are the people stunted? Every Wednesday night, Bible study, there's got to be material for the soul. Everything at some point has got to be done justice to. Everything has got to be covered. People, one moment people need encouragement, another people need challenging, another people need views of Christ, another they need systematic, uplifting, stirring, intellectually stirring views of the doctrines. That's why you need the public ministry. Behind the scenes, all these things have to be considered and the preacher has to be constantly examining himself. And like the cook, are all the ingredients being paid attention to? Is it nourishing and is it edible? Or is it boring? Or are people deflected? Or is it too difficult to take in? Or is it too easy so that the depths of these things are not properly grasped and considered? If you stay away, you miss what God has provided. You know, you need sometimes the same challenges many times a month to thrive spiritually and to be close to the Lord. And we opt out of public ministry, come once a week. You're not getting most of the nourishment God intended. You're surviving on a meal a week. So I'm sorry to put it like this, but that's all the preacher is. He's a cock. The word is here. He's got to do his best to reproduce it and to apply it and to honour all its departments. I spent much too much time on that, but dear friends, don't neglect the means of grace. It's God's appointed way of helping. People say, I don't need that. I'm all right. I, I, I don't need to come on a Wednesday. I don't need to join in prayer on a Monday. I don't need these different services and meetings in the Lord's house, well then, unless you're getting special grace because your circumstances, God knows your circumstances are peculiarly difficult and he's upholding you by a direct special dispensation of his power, you'll be diminished. Backsliding is an awful thing, you know. Backsliding isn't a New Testament term. It is in the New Testament, but not in the sense of the backsliding soul. It's an Old Testament term. Sliding backwards. It's very graphic. Here's everybody else going forward. And you're going backwards. You're reverting to what you were as a young Christian. Before you were a Christian, you're sliding back. If most people are going forward and you're going backwards, the gap between you is opening up at a great rate. We'd be horrified if we could see the damage that's done even by a few weeks. Spiritual coldness, sliding back, the gap opening up between where we should be and where we've slipped to. It's tragic. It's very sad. Dear friends, don't let it happen. That's the essence of this passage. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. The apostle appeals, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Some people 
offend in marriage. I must touch on this. There are some husbands and some wives who are very cold towards each other or unforgiving or hard. This is more true of the men than of the women, but it can be the women also who are unaffectionate, unloving and don't try, but it's usually the men and they're good men and they get into the habit of being unkind, bullies, insensitive, making no efforts with love and affection. They don't understand that headship in the marriage is to be conducted with regard to spiritual equality and sensitivity and a great deal of sharing. Well, this will affect your own spiritual walk because if you're bad to your wife, not necessarily that you do anything cruel or terrible, but you're just cold, uncommunicative, uncooperative, unkind, unhelpful, how do you expect God to be kind to you? How do you expect your Heavenly Father to treat you well and to communicate to you an abundance of assurance? How do you expect when you go to him in prayer to have your heart filled with love and a realization that he is your God and he hears and assurance that you're his? You won't get it, friends. It's a principle of God. God will treat you as you treat your wife. We've got it here in Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, yeah, we could uh, read it in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. You don't. So you will not feel the effects of God's love. Why the principle, again, is uttered by Christ in a statement accompanying the Lord's Prayer which you know well. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now that's a principle of God's working. If you don't love your wife, or if you don't love your husband, God will not love you. He won't lavish upon you things that you meanly withhold from the one you're responsible to. So think of that. So I bring that into the matter of spiritual coldness. Are you cold? To children, wife, others. So I have to announce that and uh, mention that. Some people have a quite different problem. The reason why they grow spiritually cold is that they just can't say no to things. I know a number of people like this have done over the years. All kinds of people will say, come and do this, especially among the young, come and do that. Yes, I'll come. They can't say no. There's no discipline, there's no stand for them. I can't do this, I'd like to. This is an innocent pursuit. This is somebody I know, but if I do this, I won't have a quiet time today. If I do this, I won't be able to do other things that I promised. I won't have sufficient time and energy to cover the work I've got to do and to live my spiritual life. Some people never think of that. They say yes to everything. Do you say yes to everything? Everything that's pleasant, everything that's congenial, Everything that's attractive, whether it's fitting, whether it's appropriate, whether you can accommodate it, really. You've got to have a stand. I pointed out this word stand keeps recurring in the passage which is open before us. Well, I must move to conclusion. To be spiritually cold, no more proving the Lord, 
No more heartwarming insights. No spiritual surprises. You're just a little bit away from God. So verse 10, dear friends, renounce self-reliance. Begin to pray to God to help you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Tell him you need him. Tell him you need his help and his strength. That you're failing, that you're slipping back. Pick up your duties, verse 11. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. Tell the Lord you want to protect your mind and your thought life. You want to protect your heart and your affections. Tell him you want to protect your will, your determining volitional faculty so that you, with discipline, do the right things and not drawn away to distractions, television and all the rest of it. Put on the whole arm of God. Take up your duties. Seek after sincerity. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Lord, return me to sincerity. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, the following of conscience, and verse 15, Lord, return me to witness to live as one who has a testimony to others. And Lord, return me to faith. Verse 16, taking the shield of faith and trust day by day and I shall examine all the things that are put before my mind, every temptation. And verse 17, Lord, return me to the great objective so that I live for the return of Christ and the great and coming day, not for what's happening in the world. And return me to the study of the scripture, both the public ministry and my own reading and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And return me, Lord, to prayer. Verse 18, praying always, with all kinds of prayer, praise and worship, supplication and asking, watching thereunto, and return me, Lord, to unselfish prayer, supplication for all saints, praying for others. Do these things, Lord. Return me to full spiritual warmth and life and vigor. Make me regret Every time I slip, give me humility, give me determination, give me that fresh awareness of the ferocity of the warfare and the danger I'm in. Give me a sense of guilt, Lord, to others that I hurt. How I endanger my whole family, my wife and my children. If I slip from grace and begin to behave badly and ruin the testimony and ruin their souls. Help me to see what harm I do to the church too. And some people need special grace. I don't know really whether I ought to add this comment but friends... Uh, some people are quite lonely. And for some it's a self-imposed loneliness. I had a man some years ago say to me, why is it I find so many aspects of the Christian life so difficult? And I found myself replying to him, it's because, dear friend, you don't have a wife. What's a wife got to do with it? Well, every time you went, were about to go wrong with a wife, she points it out to you. We shouldn't be doing this, dear. Don't you normally do this, dear? Why aren't you going to prayer meeting, dear? Why aren't you going to Bible study, dear? 
It's an enormous help. But you're alone. So you've got to notice yourself that you're slipping. You've got to have double the discipline because you haven't got a wife. Of course, it works the other way around too. I realize that. Well, anyway, I've said it now. The longer you're without a wife or without a husband, the harder it'll be for you because you're on your own. It is hard to be alone. You've got to watch yourself like a hawk and be so careful. You haven't got a living reminder in your life to help you. We help each other. Dear friends, don't slide. Fear it. Fear coldness. Pray to God. I was going to turn, I won't now, I was going to turn to Psalm 25. Psalm 25 is the great prayer. If you're slipping, make it your own, amplify it, enlarge it. If you don't feel up to prayer, take that psalm, read each verse, and then pray it for yourself in your own words. It's the great balm and medicine for the backsliding moment, the coldness of heart moment. So important for us all, dear friends. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might.